about this one? <laughs> Can he sign it up right now? But do you see that, like, without even opening either of these books, we probably have different assumptions about this book than we do this book. This is probably a book for kids. It's probably going to take me about three seconds to read. It's probably got no words bigger than about two syllables. <laughs> and I'll hopefully understand it. Bless and keep me through the day. Yeah, we're going to hope that we can understand it when we're done reading it. Uh, this book, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Might be able to understand it. Might have to do some reading. Might have to Google a lot of the words that Mr. Gaddis Roy uses just by looking at it. There's a lot of assumptions we bring to any book, and the Bible is no different, but at the same time, it's way more complex. <laughs> and so often we say, you know, this is really important, and you ought to read it. Here you go. Let me know what your thoughts are. And so I want to really have us thinking about how we read the Bible. Oh, maybe, maybe. Oh, come on. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, Billy, we've got about ten more options between me and you that you could have chosen. All love. Although someone let me know, I do try and make the PowerPoints with a few enough words and large enough font they are legible. If no one's been able to read them past about uh, Kenny, then I've been wasting my time. So, how do you read the Bible? Topically? Maybe sometimes we want to know about something. Okay, all our church friends are saying it's Easter. What does the Bible say about Easter? I flip to the index. Easter. Huh. Nothing. Weird. Okay, let's try something else. Index. Resurrection. Okay, let me pick some passages on resurrection. Okay, we have to read it to please God. God tell us how he wants us to read it. A little bit. We've got some biblical principles we'll get to in a moment. So he, we're certainly commanded to read but in all seriousness, so I, I just mentioned these books. We pick them up, we start at the beginning, and depending on how interesting they are, uh, we might give up in the middle and jump around, or we probably might skip to the end. Some people will be like, oh, I can't wait to see how it ends. It's too interesting. i got to know how it ends, and then I'll read the middle. Funnily enough, some people do that with this. True. Absolutely. There is, we'll, we'll talk about divisions. Um, so today, and I meant to say this, next week we'll start with the Pentateuch. Today we'll kind of outlay sort of the goals of our study here. We'll kind of talk about some of these major questions. We'll more talk about studying the Bible this week. Next week we'll actually start studying the Bible a little bit, if that makes sense. But I want to kind of lay out what our, our goals and my approach is. And one of the things I'm going to talk about this week is the divisions of the Bible. What divisions the Bible are there? Does the Bible have divisions? We at least know Old and New Testament. If you flip to your little table of contents page, you probably have two divisions, but we'll talk about how there might be more than How many of you, when you first read the Bible, if you've read it, sat down and just read it front to back, cover to cover? Anybody? You powered through all Leviticus and all this kept going. That's impressive. Most of us probably don't. So already we know in our heads we don't read it like we read most books. We, I would say if we think about the different kinds of books there are, like I showed you kids' books, I showed you that nonfiction little, I think that was a preaching book of some kind. It was in the library, so probably. Um, if we think about fiction books or magazine articles or even those Civil War history books that I see a lot, they have different assumptions in them. A fiction book, we think, okay, it's going to be entertaining, but none of it's going to be true. Probably it might be very loosely. That's the that's the easiest way to know you're about to see a movie that's like not at all real when it says based on true events. It's like okay, how? I'm the person I gotta Google. I'm like, well, how based on true events are we getting or inspired by? But then you've got like the, the, the like some of you guys who might be Civil War buffs or history buffs. You got those Civil War books that are really deeply uh, tons of facts and figures and diagrams and maps and, and it's it's a little bit of fact and it's a lot of somebody's opinion probably too or their analysis. Hold on. Uh oh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't need to scare you. Sorry, I was gonna shut that, but we're good. 
I would say of those different types of books, this is probably the closest to those, those history books I was talking about. And I'll explain in a second, those Civil War books, in the sense that there is a lot of facts there's a lot of things that we can look back and say were true. We know who was king in this era. We know who Pontius Pilate was. We know that Jesus lived. But there's also a lot of opinion. But differently from the Civil War books, it's God's opinion. It's, it's a listing of events that happened. It's, a, it's an explanation of events that happened. But tied into that, unlike some of those history books, that's just going to be like this random guy's opinion. And he's probably smart. He wrote a book. No offense to him. But this is God's opinion. So it's, it's an explanation of, of events as they occurred, but there's also plenty of times he comments on those events. He tells us what those events should mean. He tells us what we ought to think about those events. And so my point is it's really different than most other books we've probably read. I want to read a few verses just to, to show you kind of the principles that this is, this is based on or some of my thoughts and my interpretations are based on. And I'll tell you, this, this lecture series is... Or, that's a weird way of putting it. It's based on a lecture series I had in, in school. But this class is going to be based on a little bit of stuff, a little bit of stuff I read in books, a little bit of things I've done in study, and a lot drawing from experience doing Bible studies with other people and just understanding how people do and don't read the Bible and some of the, the problems that can arise depending on how we read the Bible. So I want to read a few verses before we get started. Uh, someone read for us Matthew 5.18. Okay, uh, someone read for us 1 Thessalonians 2.23. That was 1 Thessalonians 2.23. probably a typo. I'll come back to that later when I figure out what I meant. Um, I'll read you a few sections from Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the very famously the longest chapter in the Bible. It's almost roughly the exact middle of the Bible. And it's, it's noted for its length, but it's also this acrostic where every letter of the first section in the Hebrew, the, every line begins with the same letter of the alphabet. Like the first section, it's all the first letter. The second section, each line begins with the second letter. The third section, each line begins with the third letter, so on. It'd be like if I wrote a poem and the first line was A, the second line was B, the third line was C. We did it when I was in grade school. That's about the last time I've heard that word. But it's this long, beautiful poem, and almost every single line is about how he loves the Word of God. This is from verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Verse 105. Your word, you've probably heard this one before, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I've sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O God, according to your word. This is from verse 147. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Might take me a while, but I could sit here and read all of these. But he, he goes on and on about just not the power, but the beauty, the magnificence, the excellence, the wisdom that is in God's word. And so it is from a handful of these scriptures where he said, uh, it, you know, not nor daughter tittle will pass away until all is accomplished. It will endure forever. Someone read for us 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 if you don't know it. This one I know is right, unlike 1 Thessalonians, I guess. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is God breathed, God breathed, useful for reproof, for teaching, for edification, depending on your translation. And then that last part that is, you, it is, it is sufficient. It is everything we need that we may be complete in every good work. 
And so there's a few of these verses that I compiled to sort of shape how we ought to view the Bible or how we should read the Bible. But I want to talk about some other things that we might bring to thinking about how we read the Bible. One, uh, I switched it off and on. We'll see if it wants to work for me now. You might go in and flip in my slides. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. For correction, reproof. True. Yeah, we can certainly think of it like that. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we use it for a lot of things. Um, but, but there's, I want to talk a little bit about the danger of what I would call, well, what somebody else really called, I just like this word, pre-understanding. And that is when we sit down to read the Bible, but we kind of think in our brain that we already know what the Bible says. The first one kind of stems from pride or familiarity. You can view it maliciously as pride where it's like, ah, I know this already. I don't need to read this. Sometimes it's just we're familiar with the text. Like when, we've, when we studied Jonah, one of the first things we talked about in Jonah is just the familiar assumptions we kind of have from the story of Jonah. In fact, the Old Testament probably, we're probably the most guilty of this the Old Testament, at least I know I am, that we think we know the story, then we sit down and read the story, and we're like, wait a second, that's not what I learned when I watched the VeggieTales video. That's not what I remember from the VBS coloring sheet. So sometimes what we already think we know about the Bible can actually hurt us reading the Bible. That's kind of almost confusing, isn't it? The other one that I think sometimes we're guilty of, just people in general, is having a theological agenda. Um, the, the fancy word for this is asegesis, which means you are reading into the text. And this is where we say, you know what, I really think I want to believe this. So let me go find, no, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. Ah, okay, I found the one verse, and if I use this, now I can support what I've thought. Sometimes we do that. There was a very famous uh, quote from a really, really early church father, like two, 300 A.D., that said, every heretic has their text. And if you've ever done a Bible study with somebody you agree with, and you're like, well, what I believe is based in the Bible. Surely they will understand my righteous and wise ways because I am reading them the Bible when I say what I believe. And they quote some things, and you're like, wait a second. I didn't know you also had the Bible. Hold on. <laughs> well, that means we've got to understand it right. If someone can quote the Bible and disagree with me, and I can quote the Bible and say this over here, well, then the clearly one of us is right. So we've got to kind of grapple and we've got to wrestle with it a little bit, which is why learning how to read the Bible is really important. And you'll find I'm, I'm not going to sit here and as we go through the Bible say, now that we're in Exodus 32, here's what I want all you to know about Exodus 32. And then now that we're in Exodus 33, here's what I want all you to think about Exodus 33. What, I'm trying to, what we're going to try to do is just sort of set some interpretive principles, some boundaries that will help us that when you sit down and you study Exodus 33, you go, okay, I think I can figure out what Exodus 33 is about. I think I can understand what Exodus 33 might mean to my life. So the third one, there's pride or familiarity. There's having a theological agenda, which just means you're reading into the text. The third one is cultural baggage. Some of you who are in our Sunday morning class might remember this. I'm going to show you some scenes some pictures from Bible stories, and I want you to guess what they're from. What do you think this is? Does anyone even want to guess? Jonah. Yeah, it looks like Jonah. Except the problem is there's no pictures in the Bible unless you have one of those little precious moments Bibles, right? What about this? What scene is this from? So who's that right there? Hey, okay. Some of you guys realize this was a trick question. Who's this? Okay, so who's that? <laughs> who's this guy? It might also be Jesus. <laughs> so this right here is from Pinocchio. This, uh, another one, I think a few more of you, a little more age-tailored, might recognize Charlton Heston from the Ten Commandments. I would have thrown up from my age the Prince of Egypt, and that was animated, so I think that kind of gave it away. Um, and this is, of course, I just got this off of some random VBS poster. This is The Chosen, and this is from a very famous movie, The Passion. And so sometimes, and again, if you were here when we went through Jonah, I mentioned this, 
sometimes when I sit down, like for example, when I read the story of Jonah, and I start reading about how Jonah was a prophet, and Jonah ran from God, and when Jonah was running from God, he got swallowed by a great fish, my brain does this nice little trick, and it flips through my memory, and it goes, hmm, swallowed by a great fish, swallowed by a great fish, where do I know that story? Ah, Pinocchio. And so my brain, without even me really thinking of it, starts shooting me images of Pinocchio, and next thing I know, I'm reading about Jonah, but I'm thinking about this boy with strings and a wooden nose. And so sometimes we have these cultural baggage that we bring to the Bible that we don't even realize we're bringing because it's just it's there. And sometimes this is good because if I can picture one of these three dudes instead of just whatever a Middle Eastern stick figure looks like, it's more helpful for me to remember it. And if you've ever seen The Passion, you will never not see it when you read The Crucifixion anymore because it kind of brings it to life in a way that you almost wish you hadn't. <laughs> And so these are helpful in some ways. They're also dangerous. Because like I said, when I, when I threw this up on the screen, we're like, oh, that's Jonah. And guys, some of you guys caught on by the time I threw up uh, Charlton Heston. Maybe Moses found a razor. <laughs> Why is every, every single time we find, did God round the Ten Commandments off at the top when he was done? Why is every depiction, they're always, I don't know, it's just what they, my favorite part, and I don't get a soapbox on this. My favorite part is when they show the Ten Commandments, but they list them using Roman numerals. You know why we call them Roman numerals? Because they came like 8,000 years after the Ten Commandments. This is my two cents. So it's kind of funny. We do these things that sort of affect how we read the Bible, and whether we mean to or not, when we're done reading the Bible, we, like, we, we think of it through this particular lens. And so sometimes just being aware that this exists really helps us. I had a, another guy call this the interpretive reflex of filling in the gap. Most of us, when we're, reading a, when we're reading a story, we're picturing it at the same time in our mind, right? We're trying to play the little movie. We're trying to visualize it. We're seeing Jesus and the woman at the well, and she's got the jar and the water, and it's hot, and they're in the desert, and Jesus just sort of appears out of the mist of the desert. We're playing this movie, and our brain is just filling in the gaps. And so sometimes the stuff and the way we see the story is actually, I mean, it's not exactly how the Bible's telling us the story. And so we've got to be aware of when we're filling in the gaps sometimes and when our cultural baggage is affecting how we read the story. One particular, one particular image I really, really strongly remember is he said, you know, we love nativity scenes in the U.S. And, and most of them kind of look the same. You know, you've got Mary and Jesus and Joseph, and he's in the little trough, and it's, it's the sticks and the hay. And he says the first time he was as a missionary in, I'm going to mess this up, but it was a country in South Africa. It wasn't South Africa. It was a country in the southern part of Africa one of them. And he said they all had nativity scenes, except when they did their nativity scenes, there was like a million women following Mary around wherever she went. And he was like, okay, what's, what's the deal? He's like, Mary's alone. And so he's flipping through the Matthew, and he's like, I, I know she's alone. I can tell you, I can find it. It's like somewhere in here. Okay, I guess it doesn't say she's alone. And, they, and to them, when, they, when the way they were so used to women giving birth, they said, well, Mary, if she was pregnant, she never would have gone anywhere without all these midwives. She never would have gone without the help of all the women of her village to help her deliver this baby. And he said, wow, I've never once thought about how Mary delivered that baby. <laughs> I think a little bit of that is the luxury of being a guy. But um, he said their cultural nativity scenes look shockingly different from ours. And they fit the scripture. It's not like they were wrong. It wasn't false doctrine. It wasn't errant in some way. Their culture just affected how they read the Bible. So putting a pin in that just for a moment... What are some things, and I'll spend just a couple minutes on this, what are some things that shape your view of the world? Maybe you have kids. If you're a parent, you're always going to see things with that parent lens, right? Maybe if you grew up, how you grew up wealth-wise, socioeconomic standing. Did you grow up poor? Did you grow up rich? That might affect how you, how you spend, I mean, I think, uh, I can't remember the generation remember my grandmother's great-grandmothers, they say out of the Depression, if you were born in the Depression, no matter how rich you got later in life, you were always keeping every little thing because you remember the day that you went to the bank to get your money and it wasn't there. Boy, talk about cultural baggage. I've, you've heard me in my preaching lately. I, I seem to only see myself through the eyes of parents in the Bible. That's not even intentional. Because something is just hardwiring into my brain now to see things in a way that I didn't see them three years ago. I'm like 29 years old. That means for the other 26 years, there's probably been stuff going on wiring my brain a certain way that I wasn't even thinking about. 
and it affects how we see the world. Inevitably, it affects how we read the Bible. And like I said, sometimes this is good. It's good if you're a parent to read the prodigal son and be like, man, I, I saw this in a way I never saw it before. Or it's neat when you can go overseas and you go see Golgotha or you go see the, the South Bank or you go see Jerusalem. You're like, man, I, I see them walking town to town like I never saw it before. You're just like, they walked everywhere and it was really hot. <laughs> I see this in a way I never saw it before. But it could also result in us asking questions or sometimes I would say making demands of the Bible that just doesn't make sense. God is God, but I'm willing to bet Moses' view of God is way, way, way different than my view of God. I mean, you think about it. Moses saw God say, hey, you've sinned. 30 of you don't exist anymore. But he also saw God lift the waters up across the dry ground, push them out of the way, lead them across, and when they were across, just take out Pharaoh and his armies, just like it was nothing. So I bet Moses' view of God was pretty different than my view of God. I bet, at, even at Moses' time, I bet an Israelite's view of God was different than Moses' view of God. We know that because it said God talked to Moses like what? Like he was a friend. The Israelites didn't talk to God like he was a friend. God was something to be feared and cowered in front of, right? So Moses talked to God like he was a friend. And so we have these things that affect us, that, that affect how we view things in the Bible. And so... Honestly, the almost the big. Yeah, that's what we were talking yeah, about yeah. last week. Right. Well, the, yeah, and so we see that there's just there's there's different ways of viewing God in. Well, I won't say there's different. We view God differently sometimes just based on our cultural baggage. And so as we start thinking about how we ought to read the Bible, I want to point out a few common and I would say well-intended uh, but ultimately unhelpful ways of reading the Bible. I almost titled this How Not to Read the Bible, but I tried to backpedal it and soften it up a little bit. <laughs> Number one is a theological dictionary. I've seen people, and I think sometimes we're guilty of this, we say, well, what is, what is God? Is God a good God? What is God? So we just kind of go like, oh. Isaiah 1 is not telling me what God is. Well, actually, it is a little bit. but uh, Matthew 6, that kind of tells me what God is, but not really. It's not a dictionary where I can just go to the G's and say, God, okay, now give me 17 pages on what God is. Sometimes we treat it like that. Now, no, 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 let me be clear. The Bible will answer these questions. It will tell us about God. It will tell us about heaven. It will tell us what sin means. It will tell us what resurrection looks like. It will tell us what redemption looks like. But sometimes it doesn't really do it the way we want it to do it. Sometimes we want to be able to just go to page 673 and read the Bible definition of the word sin and say, okay, sin, noun, blah, 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 blah. all the consequences of oh, sin, consequences of sin, punishment for, like we're reading a dictionary. It would be really nice. It's not how it works. The other one, the second one, is a moral handbook. And this one's a little bit more difficult to wrap our brain around sometimes. But I really, again, a minister much wiser than I, say most Christians read the entire Bible the way we ought to read Proverbs. If I go to Proverbs, what is Proverbs? It's a book of wisdom, certainly. It's a collection of just wise sayings. Not a lot of storytelling in Proverbs. Not a lot of characters. Not a lot of character development or actions. Right? You can sit down and read one or two. Okay. Do not go astray. Do, do they not go astray who devise evil? Those who devise good meet steadfast love and faithfulness. Well, that's a good little saying. Bible read for the day. Sometimes we pick up the Bible and we want to be able to read three verses and just sort of take away a good... like. God, I get that you have a lot to say, but just give me like the 140 characters or less so I can just walk away with a nice moral. Like, tell me what happens at the end, right? Just give me my nice little moral for today that I can take home and just improve my life. We kind of just look for, for wise sayings. We just say, well, just, just give me the good life advice. This other one that we're guilty of, and again, not really we that people are guilty of, is what I call a devotional, or I would even say... Uh, encouragement, ministerial, 
uplifting, emotional grab bag. And tell me if you've ever seen this. When you ask somebody how they read the Bible. Well, I just kind of flip it open. And I feel like God is leading me to Matthew 10 today. So I'm going to read a little bit of Matthew 10. And man, you know what? Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot betraying Jesus. That just really uplifted me today. That's what I needed. God, man, when I just opened my Bible, God just knew exactly what I needed to do. Oh, look at this. I just, I just let it down and it flips open. And that's those few pages, that's where I get my encouragement today. You ever heard somebody say that? I'll be careful. I'll be careful when I say this. And some of this is, uh, comes from conversations I've had with you guys. But I'm not going to say God doesn't act that way. Because the Holy Spirit might move you. Absolutely, divine providence works in your life. Sometimes, sometimes you are doing your daily Bible reading for whatever reason. You're like, man, this just resonated so perfect with me. But if your normal practice when you read the Bible is you just kind of sit it down and do this on whatever page you land and you just say, this sounds good today. It's not really how the Bible is meant to be read. And so that's really what we're talking about. This isn't, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to just tell you, hey, this is Terrence's thoughts on how I read the Bible, but I want to be giving us how does the Bible want itself to be read? How does it present itself? Well, we know at least some of the Bible are letters. Who's old enough to have written a letter in their life? Okay, good, mostly. That's what I thought. Don't, don't think into much what I just said there. Um, so you've written a letter. Okay. When you wrote your letter, how did the other person read your letter? Hopefully they read all of it. You don't know, you weren't there, but hopefully they read all of it, right? Hopefully they started at the top and went to the bottom. But a lot of times we, we take that letter that you slaved away and you had it all folded up and you wrote like seven pages and you folded them in half four times to fit them into the thing and you paid for the postage and you went and tried to get there before they closed and they opened it up. And imagine if like between it leaving your hands and getting to the post office, I just went in there and I nabbed the letter and I was like, now they got a little wordy in paragraph three. Page two, that's really good, though. Keep that. This middle part, oh, that's just a bunch of nonsense. Get rid of that. You took way too long to get your point here. There you go. I've fixed it. I've edited your letter down. I've got, I just kept the highlights of the letter. You know, that the message is kind of much the same. But I put it back in the post office, and I sent it off, and I let your loved one read your letter. You're pretty dumb, number one. Number two, you'd probably be really upset. <laughs> but sometimes that's, that's how we read the Bible. Or we go to it and we say, oh, okay, well, Galatians is like six chapters. Just what does chapter 5 and 6 say? Okay, Paul, I, I read chapter 5 and 6 of Galatians. That doesn't make any sense. Well, you know, I'm not really good at school, but number 5 seems to imply that there was at least four chapters of stuff you kind of just missed. <laughs> and then on top of that, we'll, we'll talk about major divisions of the Bible in here in a moment. But even in reading the Bible, if I start here... There's probably some assumption that I should have at least a little bit of knowledge of here. And as Christians, we are especially guilty of thinking the Bible, you guys have probably heard me say this before, but we are especially guilty of thinking the Bible starts about here. So we pick up the story in Matthew and we say, Matthew, this is really good. You're saying some things that don't make sense, but this is a pretty good story, so I'm just going to stick with it. And we ignore what is by volume, about two-thirds of the Bible. And so all of these are, are sort of true, like in terms of the theological dictionary, the Bible tells us who God is. It tells us about heaven. It tells us about sin. It tells us what being righteous means. Moral handbook. Are there rules in the Bible? Absolutely. Thou shalt not murder. Great rule. Love it. I'm glad we have it. I wish more people obeyed it. <laughs> it's a good rule. The Bible's not only a rule book, though. Anyone know what Job 2.9 says? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's weird. That doesn't seem to fit my rule book approach. That's not a very uplifting devotional message for today. What do I do with that? If I want to know what I do with Job 2 9, what would you suggest? Probably ought to read Job 1 through Job 2 8. <laughs> at least. It's maybe a little bit more than that, but at least start there. So I think these are these are well intended. And there's truth to them. Like the Bible is going to answer those questions. It's going to provide you a devotional message. It's going to provide you a message of encouragement, a message that will uplift you. It will provide you plenty of moral guideposts and rules for your life. But to say the Bible is just a moral handbook leads to problems. You know how I know that? 
Because you want to guess how most people who are not Christians hear the Bible being used? They just hear it being used as a list of rules. I hear people say, well, why do they? People don't want to do this. Well, why? Because the Bible says not to do this. Okay. And so they're in their non-Christian, non-knowledgeable self. They sit down. They go, okay, well, I'm going to read this Bible. Genesis, got a lot of weird stories, but I'm getting with it. Exodus, okay. Those are rules I'm familiar with. I've heard those before. I'm getting familiar. Leviticus. Okay. You guys said this is a rule book. You guys told me this was a moral rule book, and there's a lot of rules that I've got some problems with. Someone go tell me how Leviticus 15 applies to my life. Don't actually do that. And so sometimes they're, they're well-intended, but it can be, can be ultimately unhelpful. The Bible is some of those things, but it is also way, way more. I would suggest, and this is just something, it's from a few different things I've pieced together that I've heard. It is a unified story, some people say, that points to or leads to Jesus. You've probably heard something like that before. It's unified, which means if I go to Genesis, if I go to Revelation, if I go to Matthew, if I go to 2 Samuel, it's part of one big, long timeline story. And it points to Jesus because we would say Jesus is the main character of that whole story. The Old Testament points forward to Jesus. The letters point back to Jesus. The Gospels are present tense. They write about Jesus. Heck, even Revelation points back to Jesus. That's how Revelation starts out. And so the Bible is capable of answering all those questions and more. But ultimately, these are all guilty of just treating the Bible like a reference book. Reference books are good. If, I want to just, if someone uses a word on TV that I don't know, you know what I do? I Google it. <laughs> I'm like, what do they mean? Sometimes I'll scroll down the Wikipedia article. and be like, I, okay, you told me the definition. I still have no idea what that means. And I'm, looking, I'm scrolling a little bit. I'm like, okay, kind of know a little bit more. Sometimes we kind of do that. With, we treat the Bible like a reference book. We got our question or we got our problem or we got our issue of the day. And we go to the Bible and we say, how does this solve my issue of today? And a couple times that might work. But if that's, if that's the way you're taught to read the Bible, more often than not, you probably left very frustrated reading the Bible. And when it just didn't make sense the first time you read it, or it didn't tell you something that was uplifting right away, or it didn't encourage you right away, you went, ah, that's all I know. It's the only approach I got. That's the only weapon in my bag. And if it doesn't work, I'm putting it down. I'm going to figure something else out. Yeah. So you bring up a good point. That is, sometimes we ask questions that are not fair, or that's not the point. Sometimes we hear a story and we're like, well, that's a neat story, but what about this? Well, what about this? What about this? Especially if you're like me as a kid, you're very curious. My parents hated road trips by the time I learned to talk. So I'm like, what's that? What's that? Why? Why? See? Yeah. Me, so, number one, I would say, is let the Bible do what it is designed to do. I want to... Hmm, okay. Someone read for me Matthew 6, verse 1 through 8. And I'm going to pick a different section, and I'll read after you, just for the sake of time. Matthew 6, verses 1 through 8.
So I'll read that because there are certain passages where Jesus just, or the speaker, in this case Jesus, just says, this is what I'm telling you. This is why I'm saying not to do it. Don't pray like them. Why? Because they're vain and they don't want to be heard for the many words. Pray in secret. He says, pray in secret because God loves small rooms. Go in your room and shut the door. Don't have any rooms, you know, don't have any door in your house to ever be open when you pray. No, it's not what he's saying. He's saying don't pray to be heard. But he tells you that. It's very nice. This is from Genesis 32. Um, I wanted to read all the 22 down to verse 32. It's the very end of Genesis chapter 32. But I'm going to kind of skim it just to make my point here. Jacob took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And Jacob wrestles with the angel, and they have this back and forth. And at the end he says, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and prevailed. And down at verse 32 it says, Therefore to this day... The people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. What do you think that story is about? We get to ask a lot of questions like, okay, you wrestled with an angel. An angel like a Greco-Roman wrestler? Was he like WWE? Was he like The Rock? Coming with the people's elbow? I was wrestling with an angel. Like, I got a lot of questions, Jacob. But the beauty of this particular passage in Genesis, at the very end, it says, This is why, or therefore, to this day, the people do not eat the sinew of the thigh on the hip socket. Because that is where the t- Jacob's hip was touched by the angel. The beauty of Genesis and some of the Gospels, some of the parables, is they tell you a story. And as soon as that story is done, they say, therefore, or because of this. There's a lot of stories that have a very express purpose. They say, for this reason, I want you to know this one thing. Believe it or not, entire libraries of books have been written about what on earth Jacob was doing with the angel. And if the angel was God, because Jacob says God, but the text calls him an angel. Jacob seems to think he thought it was God. But the story has a point. And it very nicely, almost in a, in a almost fairy tale, uh, not fairy tale, fabulistic type fashion, it says, therefore... And you can almost hear, and the moral of the story is, strong and steady wins the race, right? How fast did the hare run? How many turns were in that race? Was the turtle first? Like, did the turtle cheat? Were there rocks in the way? Did somebody shoot the rabbit? Was it hunting season? We would never ask a bunch of questions like that of, like, a fable. And, again, these are not fables. I don't, don't misunderstand. I'm not talking fiction, nonfiction. But they tell us these stories in several passages, not all, Several passages of the Bible just tell you. It's really easy. Those are the easy ones. They say, here is the point of that story. Another example would be 1 Corinthians 1, 10 and 11. When Paul sits down, he says, I have heard it reported among you, da 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 Boy, that's right there. Paul's telling you, why am I writing this letter? Because I have heard from you, this is, this is, this. So the first thing on interpretation with the easy passages, in general, let the Bible do what it is designed to do. When the Bible is self-interpreting, listen. Um, next week we'll dive into the major divisions of the Bible and start talking about the Pentateuch.
I think we normally have a couple minutes, but everyone's already back in here and quiet, so I'll go ahead and keep rolling if that's all right with everyone else. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. The Word of God opens with this like this just dramatic, impressive display. You, you see almost this beginning of the movie, the scene is unfolding, and, and you hear Charlton Heston and Morgan Freeman's voice, and, and let there be light. Should have had Van read that part. But it opens with this display of of just how powerful the words of God are. The essence, the core of Genesis 1 is not just that God created the heavens and earth and everything in them, but that yes, God created both of these and all of the things in them with the ease that you and I might say yes or no to going out to dinner. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Didn't even lift a finger. Didn't wave his hand and say abracadabra. He makes this almost request. It's very polite. God does not pound his fist on the table of the heavens and demand light. God says, let there be light. There was light. The word of God begins with a story in the sense of of the power of the word of God. It's by his word that the very world is brought into existence. And it is through this same dramatic, impressive, universe-creating power, His Word, by which God chooses to reveal Himself to us. From the very beginning of the law, given on the mountain to Moses, through the prophets, through the Gospels, through all those New Testament letters that we've been studying for the last several weeks, God continually reveals Himself through His Word. John even says Christ was the Word. Christ was the Word made flesh. And so he says, at the beginning of the universe, it is the word of God that sets the universe into motion. And Christ, the one who John calls the word, says, at time immortal, at the very end of the universe, it is his word that will judge us. From John 12, verse 47. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Jesus says, whoever believes in him Whoever believes in him believes in God. Whoever accepts him accepts the God who sent him. And he says, perhaps surprisingly, perhaps surprisingly, when we think about how they saw him as a king, they thought he would establish a physical kingdom, they thought he would reign forever. I mean, he could raise the dead and heal blind people. He says, I've I've actually not come to judge the world. Other verses say, not judge the world, but to save it. He says, my word will judge him in the last day. The word that brought creation, that brought the earth out of form, that brought life out of darkness, that brought land out of the sea and the expanse over the waters. The word that was made flesh when Christ came. He says, in the last day, at the end of everything, my word will judge him. It's pretty wild. It's it's, it's an almost impossible thing to wrap your brain around. But when we talk about judging, what it means to be judged especially in the context of the Gospels. I mean, who, who better than to judge disciples than Jesus? Who, who more perfect, who without sin, to judge Jesus? No, 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 Jesus says, I did not come into the world to judge the world. My word will judge them in the last day. I think I heard one of the Jenkinses say, and they said, God only had one son and he was a preacher. That's why they enjoy preaching or encourage people to preach. He says, I did not come to judge the world. There is, of course, a catch. He doesn't say that you won't be judged. Don't get your hopes up, right? He says, no, 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 they will have a judge. But it is the world, and it will execute judgment in the last day. As Christians, we have a responsibility through the command of many, many scriptures to go out and preach the word following Jesus' example, 
to proclaim the word, to share the word, to be disciples, to be disciples of the word, students, followers, educate ourselves in the word. That's why we meet and why we study and why we do things like this. To also go forth and make disciples, as is our greatest command, well, our great commission. But he ultimately says, not to judge, but let the word judge them. He says, our responsibility is to speak the word and save the world. If you're with us tonight, and you are a reader of John's, of uh, Jesus' word, if you've read God's word, if you've interacted with her, but you've never understood it, you haven't obeyed it, you haven't understood what it means to become a, a disciple, a student, a follower of him, you can come forward at this time. If you have any other need, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? Number 50. Oh, yeah. Number 50. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the same? Um, I know we have a lot of announcements. We have a lot of things going on. I want to remind everybody real quick just to some of the events we got coming up this week. Um, this Friday is the singing at Bumpus Mills. Uh, what is it? Bumpus Mills, Hilldale, and Murray, I think, are the three that we have. You might want to go to Bumpus Mills. It's the closest. That would be my suggestion. It's probably where I'll be. Uh, Friday, we have the Easter egg hunt at the cabin at 3 o'clock. Saturday. Did I say Friday? Sorry, the 15th. 15th, Saturday the 15th. After Friday, before Sunday. 3 o'clock, Easter egg hunt at the cabin. And then Sunday, I just want to remind everybody, Sunday after evening worship, we have our VBS teachers meeting. Um, if you are a teacher or you plan to help out with VBS or teach a class during VBS, please come. Uh, if you haven't already, come check out. We've got our stuff in. Feel free to pick through it, leaf through it, pick it over. Just don't take all of it home with you. We'd like it back by Sunday so we can uh, look over it and make some decisions about what to come. Uh, if you're not going to teach at VBS, you're welcome to have an opinion uh, just somewhere else. So... Um, <laughs> you know, there's a time for that. It's just we're trying to get the teachers together and, you know, keep things in an orderly fashion. So uh, Friday singing, Saturday Devo, Sunday Bumpus Mills. Um, we have a couple of prayer requests. Um, number one, I got to see Miss Jeanette this week. She's doing a lot better. Uh, David did say she's able to see visitors now. She seems to be in good spirits. She's appreciated all the, the, the calls, cards, texts, contacts, prayers, and thoughts that they've had throughout all of this. Um, and then Jessica also asked for prayers. She hurt herself. I don't where did she go, but she was limping around. She did something to her ankle, I think she said. So uh, be praying for her. Um, I know we have a lot of people with a lot of just, you know, a variety of people to always keep in mind. Joyce, Norma, um, some of our shut-ins and things like that. Um, 
Is there any other prayer requests or announcements that I did not get? That's right, yes. I was missing somebody. Okay, we will keep a note of that as well. I knew I was missing somebody. Mm. We will, I don't see the door, so we'll follow up with them for sure. All right, well, guys, I will go ahead and close us in a word of prayer then. Dear God, we, as always, we thank you for today. We thank you for the blessings. We thank you for the ability to be here, to gather, to fellowship with one another, to try and be better followers of you, hearers of your word, and not just hearers, but doers, to live your word out in our lives. Uh, We pray right now for some of those names who have been mentioned of people who are dealing with health problems, both physical but also the emotional, mental We know that side of it is just as important, God. And I ask that you will continue to encourage those who need uplifting to to heal those who need healing. I ask that as we, we go into our weeks, that we can carry with us what we've learned, that we can truly be an encouragement to others and continue, as always, to to shine your light before men. We ask all things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll try not. Most of them will live.